Picture the traditional lecture in a large public university. On most days, I enjoy lecturing to a large room. There's something exciting about a live performance. Last year, a large lecture course was videotaped and webcast, and I was surprised to find that the best students preferred to watch it over the web, comfortably sitting on a sofa with their peers in the class, discussing my lecture as they listened to it. As much as I sometimes enjoy lecturing, it often strikes me as a way of willfully impeding the learning process. As I become more interested in how blogging can be used for educational purposes, I am often surprised at how passive we insist our students remain during a normal course. It's not like boring, like in the middle of a literacy lesson, writing up a story in the middle of your book or something and then getting bored and arms um, start aching and stuff like that. Stephen Johnson has noted that there are a couple of ways we can understand how learners make use of television. We can apply both of these approaches to blogging as well. First, we can pay some attention to the content and see whether it's worthwhile. As noted, this still needs to be done when it comes to blogging, but there are reasons to be hopeful. The second approach he takes ignores the cultural content altogether and asks whether the experience of engaging in the medium is a useful form of learning on its own. It seems that in the case of blogging, no matter what the topic is, students are learning something valuable. At the core of this, they're learning to present their ideas in written form, but it moves well beyond the mechanics of correct grammar, structure, and style. Unlike in the classroom, the blogger must think critically about her audience, its possible reactions, misunderstandings, and what alternative rhetorical strategies she can employ. All of this sets up the need for research and further understanding. While writing in the classroom might be a response, in the blogosphere, it's the driver. The blogger determines what is of interest and where her own knowledge is lacking, and knows that learning must occur if she is to successfully become part of the larger conversation. This larger conversation begins to hint at a different kind of learning, a learning that moves beyond the individual to the entire group. I chatted a bit about this with Kevin Lim, a graduate student at the University of Buffalo, who is also a longtime blogger. I asked him why it was important for him to become part of this larger conversation. When you do something about something, rather than to just listen or read about it, that is what Chris Barr has told me before, practicing the actual to see things happening mm -hmm. out there, and you might be a listener or receiver of the information, but when you do something about it, you become a participant. And because you're on a different platform looking at what's happening out there, you become part of a movement. And I think I personally feel that I'm creating change in a small way, but because Everyone else who participates in this conversation also creates this, you know, joins in. It creates an entire movement. Loggers inevitably become teachers and students at the same time, learning through their own practice of creation. That learning occurs within a social setting, but the blogosphere itself is a learning organism. Blogging is essentially a preserved network conversation. The individual who engages this network is likely to be changed by it, is likely to learn. But I don't think that's the most interesting way in which learning occurs in this network. I think the network itself is learning that communities of knowledge are evolving through the process of blogging. In 1963, Carl Deutsch published his Nerves of Government, which argued in part that the communication systems of a society carried signals that both informed and controlled. And as a result, good self-governance required a healthy system of communication. By tracing communication among groups and individuals, it was possible to understand the structure of a society. Deutsch was influenced by a moment of cybernetics applied to social problems in the U.S. Cybernetics was based on the process of feedback and learning in mechanical and non-mechanical systems. It understood learning to be an evolutionary, collective process, and no matter whether that learning occurred within a single organism, or within a species, or within a community, the same process is applied. Through communication, the system adapted to its surroundings. That we train our students through 
the structures of our schools and universities through uh, the physical architecture, through the temporal structures, uh, through the bureaucratic and administrative procedures is hardly a new idea. But while we continue to do this, uh, the blogosphere is emerging as an alternative structure for learning. It's doing this on its own. It's doing this undirected, guided collectively by all of those who are engaging in it, by the bloggers. Or, more to the point, multiple alternatives to the overarching structure of academia are already present. Observers for decades, people like Francois Letard, Marc Poster, and Pierre Lévy, among others, have told us that the nature of knowledge is changing, and with it the nature of education. Far from adapting to those changes, most institutions of learning have led the resistance against it. The things that make the blogosphere so attractive as a place for learning are the kinds of things educators have already known about for years. The question is how to strategically make use of this new learning space. Let's take a quick trip back to 1953. Let's ask some questions. There's Arthur Davis. Not his real name, but it'll do. Teaches American history. Been doing it for years. Let's talk to him. Excuse me, Mr. Davis. We've heard fine reports about this school and about the good things that you and your students have been doing. Can you tell us something about how and why you came to use your present method of teaching? Well, that's pretty big order. I might tell you how I first became interested in trying it out. It's fairly typical of our other teachers' experiences. Our staff, for some time, had been aware of the limitations of its teaching methods. Through considerable reading, committee work, discussion, experimenting, and in meetings with parent and civic groups, we tried to find the answer. The authoritarian method, with the teacher dominating, we felt wasn't the answer. Letting the students do as they pleased, the laissez-faire method, also was inadequate. The answer now, as it was then, is somewhere in between these two extremes. Recently, it seems to me, teaching has swung too close to this authoritarian model. Most of this has been driven by bad policy at the institutional level. The university I most recently left, University of Buffalo, uh, had hired a group of consultants to come and speak with the faculty in order to make changes to the institution. They asked us, they came in and said, imagine that your students are hamburgers. How can you create good hamburgers in a reasonable amount of time fairly cheaply? Students are not like hamburgers. They are just like people. There is still a place for the traditional school and the university, but it is as an auxiliary to the new kinds of learning, learning that takes place in the real world, a world that is increasingly online. We who have dedicated our own lives to learning need to be ready to lead in these new spaces, not by teaching, but by providing examples, resources, and inspiration.